Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Selena Delangre. Selena is the owner of the most loved sea salt brand in the world, Celtic Sea Salt, and also the best selling author of In Her Element Sea Salt, Surrender, and The Journey to a Whole Life. For over 30 years, she has led the sea salt industry through trends and innovation, and her passion to provide the world with clean, sustainable, high mineral salt has grown her brand to be the most trusted sea salt available. Selena is also the mother of three, the oldest of whom was born with cerebral palsy. Selena's journey of seeking healing solutions came out of her need to help repair her son's brain damage. She ultimately began questioning the cause and effect of our actions and intentions, and in turn began to study lifestyle choices that promote optimal well-being. If you enjoy today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and to help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind and to live their dreams. And now here is Paul talking with Selena about the salt of the earth. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, we're going to discuss the salt of the earth with someone I love and respect dearly, and that is Selena DeLong Gray. She is one of the founding members of what was the Grain and Salt Society, but is now known as Selena Naturally. She has incredible products. I, my, my family has been using her products for more years than I can actually remember. And so, Selena, what a great gift to have you here. Thank you for joining me and everybody on the podcast today. I'm so honored. I don't, I don't take it lightly by being invited. <laughs> well, you <laughs> earned it. You worked, you worked hard enough to really deserve to be shared. I'm excited to share you. Um, you know, Selena, of course, I'm familiar with your work and, and I've been involved. I've found the Grain and Salt Society many years ago, actually. I remember going to your website even before I wrote my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and listening to what was then cassette tapes on salt and many interesting things produced by your family. I'd love it if, to start with, you can share some of your background and let people know who you are and how you developed your approach to living holistically. Mm, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I was born and raised in Muncie, Indiana, and um, so I was not ever exposed to, well, especially in those times, you know, I was born in 1958, so in that time, there was nothing about health, nutrition, food. There was just no cause and effect of anybody talking about that, but there was something inside of me, even as a little girl, I would come into the room and say, today I'm going to be vegetarian, and never go, what's that? And I said, I don't know, it just sounds cool. So there was always been something <laughs> inside of me that wanted to be different from all of my family. Something was, <laughs> so I think it was like a calling. I don't know what it was, but. I have that too. <laughs> yeah. And, and they would like think I was crazy. But then I also started having migraine headaches when I started going through puberty. And oh. yeah. And so um, just the doctors didn't have any, any answer for the migraine headaches, cut her hair. It's too long and it's causing migraine headaches, whatever. No, that, that's and, uh, and, um, and so um, I was introduced to just another way of living when I met my husband, Philippe, which is the son of the founder of the company. And um, I remember when uh, we first went out and I ordered something, I think it was like a Pepsi and a something else. And he just stood there and I went, well, I'll pay for it. And he said, no, I just don't feel right getting a Pepsi. And I went, oh, because that's how ignorant I was. I didn't know Pepsi was even bad for you. And so then I went to their house for dinner, sat at the table with Jacques Delangre and Yvette Delangre. And um, what an eye-opening experience. I'm telling you, I here I was 19 years old sitting there and it was like um, just walking into a museum of all this information, but it was as if my soul already knew it. Like I, I knew this already. I had already been introduced to it in some other dimension or lifetime or whatever, but it just, it just felt so real. And he just, he started talking about the salt and, and it was a macrobiotic diet is what they, they followed was the macrobiotic diet. So I left that dinner and went home and I thought, oh, I don't know what to eat now. I'm totally confused how to, how to eat. I, you know, I just know <laughs> what's not to eat and I didn't know what to eat. 
Um, but very quickly, I just embraced the whole macrobiotic um, philosophy with um, Yvette. She taught me how to cook. My sister-in-law, which you just met, Stephanie, my niece, her mother, she taught me how to cook. And it was just eye-opening. My migraine headaches were completely gone. And I felt amazing. So um, that was my introduction to health and well-being. And then, gosh, just fast forward from then until now, um, look at all the different ways of opt- of you know, obtaining optimal health and well-being. So many ways. Back then it was the Adele Davis and it was macrobiotics and it was, there wasn't as many options as there is today to um, have that journey. And so that was my introduction into health and well-being. Just my own personal thing, getting rid of migraine headaches and feeling better, I realized there is something to this. There's a cause and effect to this. So that was my introduction to the wellness way. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. Um, you know, migraine headaches can come from a lot of things. It sounds to me like maybe you were getting some kind of food additives that were causing a uh, vasoconstriction effect in your brain. But I think it was a hormone thing because they went away when I went through menopause. So I've kind uh, of, you know, it's beautiful to be the age that I am because you get to have all this historical data that you got to reflect by. Life. And um, that's kind of what I'm looking at it. But I do have uh, food sensitivities also. Um, yeah, I definitely do have food sensitivities. And that's been um, my journey really from that point when I met them until today. It has been a journey. And I can't say it's been a pleasant one, to be honest with you. And even today, I feel like it's even more confusing because there's so much information to eat this, don't eat that, eat this, do eat that. And, and I feel like we've kind of become these science projects and, and we're, we're missing that ability to just enjoy life and enjoy the fact that with, you know, just praying on our food can actually transform it to be, you know, better for you. So, I'm, I'm at that crossroad right now with people and um, understanding. And I just tell people, whatever feels right to you, there is not one diet for everyone. Everybody has to follow their own path. And you can follow it by just how you feel in the cause and effect. You can go and get lots of blood work done and get your saliva and all of those different tests done to help you through it. But at the end of the day, it has to be something that you're aligned with or it's just not going to work. Macrobiotics worked for me at one time and then it stopped working for me. So I had to branch off to other things. See, so. Yeah, that that's, you know, diets are what I call the slow way to learn metabolic typing, meaning that people have a diet, they feel better for a while, then they stop feeling good. And then inevitably they find another diet, they feel better for a while, they stop feeling good. But when you break it all down, if a person does what you're implying and pays attention to how their body's responding literally from meal to meal mm-hmm. and learning that it's really usually about first of all quality if the quality's there like quality organic food then that's covered then it's what is the ratio of plant foods versus animal foods to keep it simple animal foods generally as you know have more fat in them so most people just need to identify what is the amount of flesh food versus the amount of plant foods that is the right for their metabolic need, right for their metabolic needs. And and then pay attention to how things like exercise and stress and environment change what one needs. And I think that's the, the, you know, the key relationship that's missing. And the result of not developing that relationship is people keep having to reach towards the expert's opinions, not realizing that most of those opinions are really the products of what worked for that expert, but is now being touted as what should work for everybody. Yet paradoxically, we're as different on the inside as we are on the outside. So you know, what what makes Paul Check feel fantastic might make you feel terrible and vice versa. So I think it's uh, the I think the benefit of the internet and all the access to information is that we have more choices to gather information and make informed decisions. But if we keep cutting ourselves out of the equation, then it just, you, then you have the syndrome of a menu that's got so many items. Everyone just sits there and stares at the menu while the waitress wonders when the hell you're going to order because there's just too much to choose from. Mm. That's, that is so true. And I, if you remember the newsletter, 
I was um, I was just looking at an article that you wrote in the newsletter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That <was> a <laughs> yeah, that was a while ago. But, um, you know, that's what I really enjoyed about our newsletter was just the all the diverse ways and, and the professionals and telling how their success and how they did it. Um, and didn't stay with just one way, not just because there are many ways for everybody. Is the newsletter still available? No, I um, we stopped it when um, I hired someone and gave me advice and said that um, people don't like printed material anymore. We need to go electronic. And so we um, went electronic and I didn't get one reply when I, I was I was mailing out 85,000 newsletters and when we went electronic and we were getting letters and people say, can I use it in my church? Can I use it in my school? Can I, but I don't think that I, you know, transitioned from going into, from print to electronic very well. If I could do it again, I would have turned that into um, a platform like this with the interviews or with blogs or something. But I, I did not transition that the exit of the newsletter very well. But you do still have a fair bit of information on your website, don't you? We do have that. We do have all these articles available on the website. But I was realizing what keeps me passionate about the company was the newsletter kept me passionate because I was able to sharpen my tools by all the different information that was always coming in from all over the world. And it felt that was such a that was such a great thing to do. It disciplined me to expand my knowledge. Right. I think the simple solution is to start a blog because you can write that electronically and it's easily accessible as mm -hmm. a URL. So um, I, I think your newsletters were fantastic. And, and I would encourage you to, if you want to keep sharing and, and using that as your own uh, way of doing research and sharing what you find, then a blog is a fantastic idea. Um, I'm curious if you you know you you met your your husband. Can you share a little bit more about how you got into the salt business, mm -hmm. um, and a little bit more about the background on the Grain and Salt Society and and how that transitioned to become Selena Naturally? Yes. Well, the founders of the company, Jacques and Yvette, they um, Jacques was um, called to write a book on salt by a um, a macrobiotic philosopher named George Osawa. And so Jacques wrote the book, Sea Salt's Hidden Powers, in the 70s. And when, when he wrote that book, um, there were several different influential uh, professionals, such as um, uh, Dr. Batman Goolish, uh, Dr. William Campbell Douglas, Dr. Whitaker, Dr. Bruce West. These are like real pioneers way back then. And they all had their, they all had their newsletters. They got a hold of this information that Jacques was sharing and started to share it in their newsletters. And they all had a pretty good audience. And remember, this is before the internet. So this is all through word of mouth, through books and newsletters. And it was just an overnight explosion from that. They put it in their newsletter and they said, send $5 to the Grain and Salt Society in Paradise, California, and they'll send you a pound of salt. So Jacques and Yvette go to the post office and there's all these big white bins with all these envelopes and it was a $5 bill. <laughs> and that's really how it all started. The reason they put $5 on it was because he was having a potluck and somebody said, I'd love to buy some. So he put some in a baggie. He goes, well, here's a pound. He goes, what do you have in your pocket? He says, five bucks. He goes, okay, it's five bucks. And <laughs> that's how the price of the salt came what it was, which was very good because in the you know next in the future 40 years everything it took to get this salt to the to the person was a lot so it's a good thing he didn't say it's a dollar <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yes uh that book i've read that you held up yeah and george osawa didn't he learn from misho kushi no they george osawa and michio that he did not learn from from michio they had their own things george osawa was more of the French or the Belgium, Belgium way of the macrobiotics. And he had his own research and everything that he did. Michio Branch, he did his own thing here at the Cushy Institute and they did a whole different thing. They even had different philosophies and different things. So, um, you know, they definitely both followed macrobiotics, but he didn't study on him. So Lima and Giorgio Sawa was who Jacques and Yvette followed and studied under more than Michio, even though that they were all in the same group. And remember back then, 
um, that was the only, you know, there wasn't all these different groups that there are now. So the macrobiotic community was like a family. But even within that community, there was some hostility. There was a lot of ego. And, you know, my salt's better than your salt. My miso is better than your miso. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of that. And that was the one thing that in this observation into this natural uh, products environment and this thing was, I, there was something inside of me said, that can't be healthy. That interaction and that, that cannot be healthy. And so there was always this observation I noticed in these diets of the egos and this way is the only way just to me never did seem um, in harmony. Um, yeah, well, you know unfortunately, I mean? it seems to go wherever human beings go from uh, my observation. I think but, you're so right. Yeah, I studied a lot of Misho Kushi's work, and um, I've studied some of George Oshawa's work, but mostly because of other authors referring to him. I'm trying to remember the name of the lady who was a, a chef, and she wrote, a couple of fantastic books, but Sandy. George- yeah, it could have been Sandy. Um, I can't think of her last name. Christina. Um, yeah. I can't remember. I've studied her work and it's extremely good. And, and yeah. um, she references him quite a lot. Um, could you share the mission, vision, and values of the Grain and Salt Society? And before I ask you that, do you still refer to the Grain and Salt Society or you, did you completely change the name to Salina we complete We completely changed the name. And we, yeah, we did that because as we were expanding other products that didn't have anything to do with salt, we had to, we had to figure out a way, something that made sense. So we got away from the Grain and Salt Society um, because it just didn't make sense. So we just moved to Salina Naturally. But the, the, our mission here is to be the number one brand or the number one recommended brand in the world, because I feel that it's um, the integrity behind the salt is important for everybody to have. And by being that number one brand in the world, my mission is to empower young people with those resources. So I want to take the resources and the profits from the company and be able to empower young people are my values. I love to empower the younger generation. So to empower the younger generation with those profits and resources from the salt. I also want to, my vision is to partner with more people like you and that amazing man, Dolph, that you just introduced me to. I sent him, I sent him all my salts and he, he did um, uh, like a profile on all of them. And he said the flower of the ocean, he said, it's almost like not even from this planet. Um, so yeah, it was so I, interesting. I he said, Oh, it was interesting to said, but my vision is to really, because I will do all this analysis on all these salts, but I'm not a doctor and, and I don't know that. So it's important for me to continue to build relationships with people such as yourself and all these people and behind me um, so they can help me understand what are all these analysis mean to our body and why does it matter? So that's, that's the mission that I have for the company. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I had, I, I never finished the question, but I was going to ask you what's important to you as a woman and a mother and a CEO of Selena Naturally, but you kind of touched on that. But, you know, one of the things I love from our previous conversation is you have a very strong, powerful mother archetype energy in you. And so you mentioned your, your concern for the young people of the world and you know, I think that's extremely important. They're dangerously lost out there. And, you know, this whole thing of massive menu, I mean, most kids today are living on, on cell phones and tablets. And so they're just overwhelmed with so many experts telling them opposing truths. It just seems like there's a real desperate need for wise elders like yourself. And that's one of the reasons I love my podcast is, is, there's a lot of younger people that listen to it and I like to be able to, you know, give them experts like yourself and resources where they can get real healthy products and foods and learn how to think constructively instead of just being told what to do. So are are there any comments you'd like to share as a mother and, and as a woman that (laughs) understands what young people are going through right now with regard to what you guys offer? Yeah, I'd like to share that. This is a note that I just got from a little girl. There's oh, um, 
a little, um, all of my employees, I told them that there was a theater that just started here in Asheville, North Carolina for um, young people. And I told the, everyone here that I would pay for their kids to go and I'd sponsor them and pay for all their expenses to go. Well, after I did that, there was one employee's daughter that gave me this note. Um, if you, do you mind if I read it to you? Please go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, dear Selena, thank you so much for everything. I am so grateful that you have been able to pay for my theater. Um, your, um, home, your home, um, you have, um, you have no idea how much this means to me without you. I wouldn't have met all of these new people and friends who now are all very important to me without you. I probably would have never have joined anything like this. Theater is now one of my favorite things ever. I absolutely love working on these musicals and working on them with all of these nice people. I can never stop talking about the theater and how it is for us. Again, thank you so much for everything. Um, now, a little bit more about this little girl is um, during the COVID, Paul, she really went, she went backwards. Um, she really, she couldn't um, socialize anymore. Her mother was really concerned because she just couldn't even socialize. And um, she, she would almost start crying. Um, she just lost herself. Going in and doing this empowered her. And that's what feeds me. That's what feeds my soul. If I could just have, you know, just more of these, that would just make my day. That's what, that's what feeds me. And I think that's what we need more of um, is to find ways that we can help these children um, find their purpose and find their creativeness and, and see how they can, um, you know, express it. And, and I really, unfortunately, I know there are some amazing school teachers out there, but I just think that they're not going to get that in schools. And I even think people aren't going to church as much anymore either. So they're losing that fellowship. So I think as an employer, it's our responsibility to be thinking about not just when you hire someone, but you're hiring those children too. You're taking those children on that they have also as your responsibility. And that's, that's the kind of CEO that I think women in the corporate world can start doing for our community and our, our whole civilization. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to announce our new live show called PT 3.0 that will be available to you at youtube.com forward slash Czech Institute. That's C-H-E-K Institute. Each PT 3.0 episode will be offered every first and third Wednesday of the month and is a 30-minute live show designed specifically to help exercise professionals and anyone who wants to use exercise scientifically in their practices. The host of the show will be a Czech faculty member, a high-level practitioner, or an industry expert that is aligned with Czech principles, and each show offers us the following free bonus materials. A Q&A segment at the end of the episode a downloadable reference guide to help audience members apply what they've learned. We call this PT 3.0 because the purpose of the show is to provide next generation training to personal trainers and to help them evolve in their practice. PT 3.0 is a web show designed to provide 30 minutes of intense, essential training to personal trainers and strength coaches that will make an instant impact on their business and practice. This is not a webinar or a podcast, but a fully produced online show featuring a live host and high quality footage of assessments, exercises, stretches, and program design together with Q&A for targeted bite-sized education. Each episode will be highly focused, training, for example, one assessment or one program design technique or one stretch, etc. Each episode will be broadcast live on our YouTube channel and the show is free. Hallelujah. Each episode will be recorded and available to you on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Czech Institute. And again, it's completely free. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for notification when each episode begins by going to youtube.com forward slash Czech Institute. To see our upcoming episode schedule and to receive advanced notifications of all episodes, go to pt 3com checkinstitute.com. Once again, to see our upcoming episode schedule and receive advanced notification for all episodes, go to pt3.checkinstitute.com. We hope you enjoy this live show. You probably remember this music. Do you remember the 
music Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass Band? Yes. Well, there's a phenomenal documentary on Amazon, and I think it's called Herb Alpert Is. Huh. And it's stunningly beautiful. You know, he's 84 now and he still makes beautiful music and his wife's a great singer. And, and you know, as soon as you start hearing his songs, you'll remember them because they're from right from our generation. Wow. And, you know, he, he's he, he had like 50 hit songs. But the reason I'm sharing that is because he donates something like 120 he's donated something like 120 million dollars to starting dance and theater uh, schools and music schools dance theater music schools for children and uh, there was a big school in the bronx that was going broke and he happened to read an article in the newspaper and he immediately reached out to them and and basically refunded the whole place Mm. so in the documentary it shows all the work he does to donate huge amounts of money to do exactly that because he really feels that there's a lack of of creative expression for young people and and how dangerous that is so he puts a huge amount of money in into that and the, and he's such an incredible man i think anybody would be tremendously inspired and not only that he's an amazing artist and a sculptor as well mm. and he's got beautiful art but i just wanted to share that with you Thank and you. with everybody listening cuz I, I've watched it two or three times now because when I see a soul that gifted and that powerful and that humble and beautiful, it's just like I can't help but share it with people, which is why I want to share you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and, and Selena, you know, you're so you're 64 now? Yes. You still are very beautiful. I mean, you're really a, a great example of healthy living for women, I think. That's <laughs> quite, you know, I think... For those of you that are listening that can't see Selena, she's really a gorgeous woman. And I hope I'm as beautiful as you at 64. I think a lot has to do with, um, I, I wake up every day and ask to be a reflection of God every day. And I really believe that, um, yes, it is my lifestyle, but at the end of the day, I just strive to shine every day and be that light every day. Well, thank you. <laughs> Um, can you share an overview of the importance of salt, the misconceptions mm. of salt, such as the medical misconception that it raises blood pressure, mm. and mm. how and where you source your salt, and what mm. makes good quality salt versus poor quality? Now, there's a lot of questions wrapped up in that. So just a, a, a review, the importance of salt, the misconceptions of salt, where do you source it, and what makes a good quality salt versus mm. poor quality? Well. Sodium chloride salt is very important um, to the body it, because it's like the battery charger of our body. It's, it, it is the charging mechanism that keeps our electricity going. You could even put um, a glass of water and put one of those electric probes in there. And mm-hmm. you can put it to a light bulb and put salt in there and the light bulb will go out. So the, just sodium chloride alone is amazing for our electrolyte balance, for digestion, for um, bringing um, not not just sodium chloride, but the sea salt that has all these minerals in it. But salt itself is important. There's a book that um, um, this gentleman wrote, um, The Salt Fix. Oh, and great. Yeah, and it's really a great book. But he, he says the culprit is not really salt, it's sugar at the end of the day. It's the oils and the sugars. It's not salt at all. And there's some articles out there that even say when they first started testing and started making this whole assumption, you come in, you have high blood pressure, get off the salt. It was really due to just a little bit of information was out there that was really not completely tested and validated that just giving up salt is going to make your blood pressure go down. Yes. And and that, I think if I could interject, that distinction there has to be made between sodium chloride versus actual salt, because I, I learned reading your book that what is it, 97 or 98 percent of the salt in the world is actually made for manufacturing. And so it's yes. refined and purified. But then they sell it in the to, in the food chain as salt. But it's actually purified for chemical processes, not for human consumption. And so they take all the minerals out and then sell them to the <laughs> through the food store chains like GNC. So you end up buying the same minerals twice when really the minerals, the trace minerals and the ocean elements have tremendous benefits to the uh, human b- body, especially regulating the hormonal system. 
And, you know, Paul, this was a trend that was really just happening, you know, probably when all these foods started becoming fortified. So people couldn't just live with just regular sugar. They had to make it white. They couldn't just live with flour. They had to make it white. So, you know, in the whole transmutation of of how our food kind of got destroyed was it was for convenience and, you know, for shelf life. And it didn't have, they didn't even think about what it was going to do. The cause and effect was going to do to the health of our bodies. And salt is one of those things. Also, it's basically very simple is to try to eat foods that are as whole as possible so that you can get the transmutation of all the nutrients within the food. Um, I had an interview with Dr. Tom Cohen and I asked him, I said, um, there was a gentleman in Spain that was, he said he could make a fortified salt for me. So, and the reason he was going to do that was because our light gray salt comes from Brittany, France. And if something happens to that source, I don't have a light gray salt anymore, but I have sourced other salts with the same mineral profile, Guatemala and Mexico. So I'm okay. We have the supply, but for a long time, I was always looking for this backup for the the gray salt that everybody feels that is the most important salt to eat. So I met this gentleman in Spain and he, he was a, a chemist and a food person and he said we can fortify it. So he started to get the analysis of the light gray original analysis and he started to add a magnesium, potassium and calcium. I mean, magnesium, potassium and calcium to the salt to make it more of like the original salt. So I asked Dr. Cohen, is that possible? Can our body tell the difference? And he said, absolutely. When you take an isolate and you've added to it, your body does not know how to distribute those nutrients as well as it does if it's already naturally occurring in all of that. Just like I think like cocaine in its natural form to do the leaf is medicinal, but then to to make it the chemical, it's this really harsh drug, you know? Right. Just like alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take alcohol out of a plant, it becomes very, very addictive and damaging to the liver and causes all sorts of trouble. But if you, for example, have a fermented alcohol that comes from a natural source like honey or any of many other things, it it isn't quite the same. But when you have this refined process, then it, it leads to all sorts of disruptions that you don't get from the less refined products. In fact, uh, you you can even make LSD if you know how to harvest the right um, fungus. I don't remember the, the, uh, there's a, you can do it from a variety of sources, but I've had friends that are, you know, biochemically oriented, tell me that you can even get LSD in a natural state. That's Mm. actually far better for you and less stressful to the body. Now, of course that's a a drug, but I'm just using it as an analogy to Mm -hmm. make the point that there's a certain point in a process of reduction at which you disintegrate the, you know, what Royal Lee called the vitamin complex. And he showed how there is no such thing as isolate vitamins in nature. A vitamin complex has fats, proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, trace minerals, enzymes, phenolics, terpenes, and alkaloids, and they all work together. He gave a beautiful analogy. He says, what part of a watch tells time? (laughs) Well, we all know the whole watch tells time. So he says, when you break a food down, using the analogy of the watch, there's a certain point at which it no longer is an integrated holistic system, which is what your body's designed to utilize at the cellular level. So what happens is he describes how taking isolate vitamins is like eating parts of a watch. So if you eat a thousand sweep hands, we'll call it a thousand milligrams of ascorbic acid, your body has to run around and scavenge all the rest of the pieces of the watch to put that ascorbic acid back into a functional complex, which then leaves you with a deficit of other nutrients. So he he describes how people keep taking all these isolate supplements, not realizing that they're creating other deficits as a knock-on effect. So the the real thing to remember is that in order for a watch to work, all the parts have to be working in an integrated harmony, and that's exactly how nature produces nutrition to work. So what happens is you get all these people with all their PhDs and fancy degrees that keep isolating everything so they can patent stuff. And the next thing you know, we've got well, look at, we've got a field, we've got a long t- running field of nutrition and dietetics, supposedly educating dietitians, 
yet we're the fattest, sickest, most tired people we've ever been while we have the most information we've ever had. Why? Because it's all based on reductionist science, not holism. Well, I can even add to that. When my um, Stephanie was designing our label, she has to work with an FDA attorney and all these things. And we had on our label healthy salt. We, the FDA says we can't put healthy salt, but Kellogg's can put healthy Cheerios. You know why? Well, Because they're yeah, be- fortified. Well, and because they have a lot of lawyers and a lot of money. Absolutely. So isn't, but that's what I'm talking about. The consumer is out there and if they aren't educated and they're just going shopping and their brain is saying healthy, they're picking up all these things with the assumption that it's healthy, but it's Well, there's right. actually a name for that. I don't know if you know this, but cause I've studied the science of marketing and how the brain is programmed because I wanted to see how they keep doing this selling junk so effectively. The term is called an empty signifier. Hmm. An example of an empty signifier is seeing on a package food that is good for you or the word healthy. Right. So what they do is they use words that have a preconceived uh, concept such as healthy or food that is good for you, but they put it on top of a box or a package full of garbage that costs them pennies and sell it to you for dollars. And you actually particularly mothers buying this food think, oh, this must be good. It says it's made naturally, but that's classically called an empty signifier. So Mm. what they do is they trick you by using words that have preconceived notions that you think add value, but they actually are being used to give you something of no value. While you were talking, you mentioned all the white salts and white foods. And I wanted to share a little history with you and the listeners. Do you know where the history of white foods being so popular comes from? No, I would love to hear that story. Well, back, I believe it was the 15 or 1600s, the British royalty were the only people that could afford the manpower and the labor to sift grains until they got all the fiber out and all the germ out as much as they could. So they were left with nothing but the starch, which we now call white flour. And they made breads, cakes, and pastries and things out of this amazingly white flour. So all things white became to be associated with the royal family. Mm -hmm. So everybody wanted to emulate them. So now we see white salt, white milk, white bread, white stuff. But what people didn't realize is that the process of making it white obliterates the nutritional value, and they now even use and have been for a long time use bleach and other chemicals to whiten food, just like people chemically whiten their teeth instead of using quality toothpaste. So uh, I just thought I would share that because very few people are aware that the history of white food goes right back to British royalty. And I'm sure, Paul, that if they had the historical data of med- medical records, they'd probably show that royalty was not as healthy as the less royal. <laughs> well, we, we know that because yeah. <laughs> uh, look at all the scandals they're involved in all the oh, time. Amen. Yeah. You know, now one of the things we, we didn't touch, but I'd like to hear you talk about is what is it for the person listening that distinguishes a good salt from a poor quality salt? If someone doesn't know how to find you, let's say, which is already going to be good salt. But what would be a tip or two if you're in the supermarket and you just want to buy a good salt versus a not so good salt? What do you look for? That just, that's a really um, hard question to answer just because of what we just talked about with labels. Um, Well, we know for sure, not a, not a white one. Right. Exactly. You can't really trust it, but I will say um, it's, I'm going to go back to that, but I am going to explain to you um, when Jacques wrote his book, um, Sea Salt's Hidden Powers, and he talked about the the gray salt is really the salt that has all the nutrients and it's the most um, nutritional salt that there is, Um, which I, you know, I believed him and I believed all the analysis, but if he was alive today, he would be right there with me, realizing that anything could happen with this region. 
of the place that only sells it. So I started to explore other salts from all over the world just to make sure that if something should happen to that region, which there was an oil spill at one time in that region, and you know we were going to get salt in trucks ourselves because there was no salt, they had to shut it down. Um, so in that diversification, we start. I started looking for other salts. And ironically, the only salt that you can get in that gray color is from Brittany, France. And it's because of the clay line beds there that give it that color. So I thought, well, is that the only place you can get nutri uh, nutritional salt? So I started to um, explore other salts from other regions and having the same analysis done. I have so many analysis. I have this big book here. I mean, it's this thick of these analysis that I have done of the salts because I really... Um, keeping Jacques' integrity was very important to me. And I'm not a scientist or um, a nutritionist. So I, the only thing I had to go by was let's compare this, the data of the analysis to see if it's as um, good as the light gray salt that he would already recommend. So we got a salt from, um, the first one was from Haiti. Um, these four gentlemen from Haiti um, came to me and they said, you know, we have this salt and we really want you to look into it and see if it's a good salt. And I had it analyzed, sent it to the lab, and I said, it's a pretty good salt, but it sure is white. <laughs> and uh -huh. I thought, ah, wait a minute, how is it so good? And it's white, you know? Fl I flew to Haiti to see where how it was harvested, and it was like right next to the, the, um, the shore. And most of these salt harvesting places aren't that close to the shore, but it was right next to the shore. But it was a, you know, silica sand line beds, so the, it was white, but the nutritional value was beautiful. And it was, it was a really beautiful salt that I started bringing in, but that poor island just collapsed. I kept putting money into that um, partnership and um, the government, it was just didn't work. So um, if for, at least it gave me confidence to know that there is salt, there are salts out there that still hold the same um, profile, mineral profile as the gray salt, but they are white. Right. So, well, that's good I, to know. Yeah, I, I think I think um, it, one of the tips would be the company that's selling it. The companies that's selling it, I would say, um, you know, I, I really think Real Salt is a really good company. Personally, mm -hmm. I I love them. I think that they're, um, you know, they have a lot of integrity. Um, the mineral profile is different than us. The pH is a little bit different than us. But if they were looking for a salt, I think that look up the company in, in the grocery store, it's going to be hard because labels are just completely not going to help support that decision. But I would go and look up the company and say, do you do analysis on your salt? Um, can you tell me about all the different minerals in your salt? And that's what I would really recommend for the average consumer to go out there and look for salt. Obviously don't buy a salt that has additives. You know, that's right. a pretty, that's a no brainer is just if it has yeah. any kind of, um, uh, iodine or free flowing agents or anything like that, just don't even buy it. Um, but I would say you're not going to get that information at the store level. You're going to have to do a little bit of research because even on the analysis, you're only going to get the sodium chloride. You're not going to get all those beautiful trace minerals on your analysis. Right. It yeah. would be too, it would be quite a, quite a big, uh, you'd have to have quite a big label. You would have to have a big label and also the nutritional panel only gives you the opportunity to give a certain um, percentage, uh, you know what I mean, on the nutritional panels. Okay. So you wouldn't be able to do that. So I'm sorry I didn't really answer that question very well. I think it really just goes back to going to the company, look at the brand, and everybody has a phone and just look up that brand um, and say, do you have analysis on your salt? And do they have minerals? So that would be my my main thing because you can't go by the color, you can't go by the package, you really can't go by any of that. Well, the you know the the other thing is now you, you typically have to buy it to do this, but I think this goes back to what we discussed earlier about paying attention, and that is simply put some of it in your mouth, wet your finger, dip it in the salt, put it on your tongue, and pay attention to how your body responds. Exactly. And and you know what I like doing is. You know, we have a variety of salts from you, but um, Angie, my second wife, gave me a gift of a beautiful box set with 50 different salts in it from mm. around the world. All everything from these volcanic salts to, you know, wild, you know, all sorts of colors and mm -hmm. all very, really high quality. So I would just test them and, and might just ask my soul, which ones do you want to play with for a while? And right. And taste them and, and just see how my body responds and what does my energy do. But I found that, you know, if you get a, a sense of 
increased vitality or a sense of centered energy, then that's a good one. But if you get something that tastes sharp or seems to pull your energy down, I found the better the salt is, the more it tastes almost food-like and the less it tastes harsh, like a chemical. Yeah, like a chemical, like an isolate, you know? Yes, yeah. Uh, Like, for example, there's a big difference between eating acerola cherry as a source of vitamin C and ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is very acidic and sharp, Mm -hmm. but acerola cherry is a very concentrated form of cherries. Mm -hmm. So if you just say there's an example, I think just paying attention and, and that practice is so important because if you start really developing an awareness of what your body's telling you with response to any input. You can do it with water. You can do it with food. You can do it with anything. I, I agree. And that's why at all of our trade shows, we have our salt there so people can t- taste it. We're very proud to have people have the experience and taste the salts while they're there. Hi, everybody. One of my favorite Symbiotica products, which I love to use when you got two kids in the house that bring home all sorts of stuff from school and have runny noses and coughs like kids often do. So if I need a little backup, I get out my Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C. Tastes great, feels great. I use it regularly, and it's just a good backup plan to support your immune system. But better yet, I've got Shervin, the creator of the product, right here to tell us more about it. So Shervin, what's unique about your liposomal vitamin C? Well, this has evolved over the years. This is our ninth iteration, and this is coming from fermented cassava, Mm. not coming from corn. And it's in liposomal form, and we also have added compounds in there, including biotin and potassium bicarbonate, which is a very highly absorbing form of potassium. This right here is delicious. It is delicious. You know, we're using organic vanilla and organic extracts and citrus bioflavonoids, and you're getting a thousand milligrams of fermented vitamin C in liposomal form. So we're talking about pure absorption. So if you're, you know, you got the everyday cold or you're feeling the chills or you just need a boost in your immune system, boom, you can hit that right there. It's good for children. It's good for, you know, elderly. Anyone can have it. And it is one of my favorite products. Or if you're going to go on an airplane or being around a lot of people that aren't healthy and you just want a little immune backup or immune boost. Absolutely. That's delicious, Mm. high absorbing, and gets to the subcellular level almost immediately. And kids love it. Kids love it. I haven't met anyone that doesn't like the flavor. It's beautiful. Yep. So to get your Living 4D discount, go to symbiotica.com. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. To get your 15% discount on checkout, use the code capital L, number four, capital D, 15. Enjoy your Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C. We've talked about this a little, but I'll give you a chance to add more. High quality salt is an important source of minerals and trace minerals and other nutrients from the ocean. And I, I, I really loved reading your book that I got from you guys years ago because it went into all the different minerals and talked about the trace minerals from the ocean Mm. and many other very, very interesting things. I was fascinated with what I learned from reading books and articles and listening to audio tapes from, from your Selena naturally, which was the grain and salt society. So can you give us some of your thoughts on why minerals, trace minerals and ocean elements in quality sea salt are so important to the body and for our general health and maybe enlighten us as to what some of the minerals and trace minerals are in a quality sea salt that we may not even be aware of as just a general consumer. Like Mm. most people don't really know what minerals are in anything unless they study nutrition, but that's just a handful of people in the world. I'm glad you asked the question. And I forget that we have to go back to the basics of that you know, I forget that people still don't understand that it's really the, um, our, it's something that's mimicking the, um, you know, the cations in our own body, which is magnesium, potassium, calcium, sodium, and chloride. Those are the fa- the five major ones in our body and our plasma. Well, that's the mineral profile we're looking in the salt. So those are the biggest minerals that you will find in the salts that we bring in. The rest of them are really trace minerals. And, um, and those trace minerals are really just as important. And people might think, oh, I need more boron, or I need more phosphorus, or I need more of that. But according to what I understood when Jacques wrote about the trace minerals, you have to take trace minerals in these 
trace amounts. If you took them in more concentrated amounts, they get clumpy in the cells and they don't even react properly. Well, they're also toxic to the body if you get too much of them. So it's important that the balance of all of those minerals are in the trace amounts that complement the salt. But we Mm -hmm. have people that say, I'm using your salt because it has lithium in it. There's hardly any lithium in there. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I know why that is. It actually has a very beneficial effect on people with depression, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's another thing that works in trace amounts. There's now lithium sprays you can get. And there's also well sources. I know in Ashland, Oregon, there's wells that have higher amounts of lithium because it's in this, it's in the earth where the water's coming from. Wow. So um, there's a, a number of psychological benefits. So that's probably why they're looking for the lithium, because even trace amounts of it can be stabilizing to people's um, mental, emotional state. Mm. Well, that's the composition of our salt. That's why we do all these analysis. But at the end of the day, Paul, I can only um, say why these salts are good, because it's the most balanced um, way to get your sodium chloride in you. It, they, all these elements and minerals complement each other and distribute. They're all vehicles for each other in the distribution of the nutrients. Um, but I really count on professionals like you guys to really tell about the science of the body and how it actually goes in the body and aids in digestion. I, can, I have all the testimonials that you, you know of my own experiences of people that use the salt. I mean, I have people that this, uh, the one woman that I, that stands out the most is she said her husband had been laying in bed for months, not being able to get up. And she thought, what the heck, I'm just going to give him a little bit of salt and some water. And he was walking around the block, you know, that day. And it's just so simple. He was completely deprived of his electrolytes and he needed that spark. When you're in a car accident and you're going into shock, what's the first thing that they do? They put you on a saline solution. They put you on a drip. (laughs) And, you know, there's this pathogenic concept of getting salt out of the diet. I still see people doing it all over the place. And it, it's just, it comes from the same idiocracy as bodybuilders taking the yolks out of eggs and, and, and the whole cholesterol myth. Right. And, and, and I, when I see that, it, it just drives me loopy. I, I just pretend that it's not happening because I can't go talk to people. And a lot of people are so lost in their dogma that they don't realize their attempts at being healthy are actually making them sick. Um, One of the things that I remember now that there was an audio tape that I listened to years ago from, from you guys. Nutritional imperative. It could be, and it was all about salt. Mm -hmm. Does, is that still available in any form? No, but we probably could bring it back available. I think you should. I I found it. I found it excellent. I still have it in my library on audio cassette. That's a great idea. I go back and revisit these things uh, on sort of a cycle so I don't forget things, but I have forgotten more than I probably remember. But um, (laughs) one of the things that was talked about, it was either in the audio or in one of the books, was, was all the trace elements from the ocean and things like micro doses of plankton and other things. I thought that was really important. And that was also close to the section where they talked about the mother liquor. Mm, I'm glad you talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. I I think a lot of people don't understand the mother liquor. And and I, I remember specifically when I first started getting salt from you guys and I would open some of the bigger bags, it was moist inside. And I said, ah, there's the mother liquor. And that's that. And that that fluid is millions of years old, you know, so you're getting the the beauty and the vitality of the oceans way before cruise ships and oil ships and military weaponry and all sorts of crap poisoning the ocean. I think that that's a, a, a quite a gift. You want to share something on on that aspect of it, some of the trace elements and the mother liquor? Yeah, the mother liquor is is like the drippings of the salt. So when our salt comes in in these big 55 pound bags, we poke holes in the bottom because every time it, it, it is transported here, there's little tiny crystals and those crystals break open. So it's like the pulp of a citrus. So when they break open that brine, mother liquor, the bitterns um, releases from that. So in order, so the customer is not getting half brine and half crystals, we actually drain that salt and we get big gallons of it. I'll have to send you a couple of bottles of just the drippings. Of I would the, love that. Yeah. yeah uh, because it's amazing. Um, we sell for baths, um, 
Ian, one of my employees, he puts drips of it in his water. Of course, it's so magnesium, you know that the flavor is um, not that great. But um, that is the drippings, the mother liquor from the from the drippings. Um, that's that that uh, those drippings is also considered to be called nagari, and that's what you make tofu with. Um, and so it is very very special, and that's we get that brine, but it only comes with the salt from France. We don't uh. get that brine from any of our other sources. The crystals, like the one from um, Guatemala, the crystals aren't, you know, it's not as wet and the crystals don't hold that brine like they do. Um, in the region of Brittany, there's four seasons, very mild winters, but they do have four seasons. So, so they only are harvesting the salt or, you know, um, having the salt crystallize between the months of May and September. All the other places we get the salt, it's all year round that they're, they're able to do it. So so there's a different form of crystal that is formed from the salt from Brittany than the other ones. And, um, but you could get the, the bitterns or the nagari or the brine from the other places. It just wouldn't come the way I just told you with the little crystals opening up, you could put it in a big cheesecloth and you could get it wet and you could make your drippings that way. If you wanted to make some with the salt, but we have it just naturally occurring. We have a gentleman that we put it in these big totes after we drain it, these huge, I think it's something like a thousand, 1200 pound totes. And he uses it for remineralizing soil in all of his agricultural processes. So I, 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 I personally think you, you should keep that brine and sell it because what a great addition to things like, you know, shakes for people that are using shakes in a healthy way for quick meals or post workouts or to, to get a, a natural source of magnesium. I mean, magnesium's crazy on the market out there. And, you know, the, the soils are pretty much worldwide depleted in magnesium. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems to me like it's, it's such a beautiful natural product that it, it would be a great addition. It might even be worth getting some researchers to see what they can find uh, as health benefits from it. Because oh, I, that'd be great. I find it. I find it fascinating. I mean, as soon as I understood what it was, I stuck my finger in there and got it all wet and tried it and thought, wow, that's just the coolest thing. I'm having water that's millions of years old trapped in the salt. And, and to me, that, that alone was enough to make me want to sense the vibration of it. Right. Well, we do have analysis on that, Brian, too. I'll send you the analysis so you can see the mineral profile of that. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. You know, among the medical and holistic health community, Selena, there's been a lot of talk regarding the high levels of mercury and other toxins showing up in salt. Um, some states stay away from stay away from salt that's ocean sourced and use salt from mines because it's less toxic. I know you look into this a lot because it's mm -hmm. your business. So, what are your thoughts in that regard, and how do you test your salt or other products to make sure it's pure of of toxic things like heavy metals and and of high quality? Well, we do get a, a analysis from all of our sources, but that's something I don't completely trust. So I do spend a lot of money having um, analysis done of all of the salts. And, um, and I mean, we don't just do the basic analysis of the salts. We do as many, as many minerals and heavy metals that they would possibly test for. So Here's one, just one of them, and you can see the pages. Wow, the, they're testing for a lot of stuff they're, there. They're testing for a lot of stuff. To go to the mercury and the lead, it is, um, it comes up, but it's 0 .00005, 0 .00002. So it is on here, but that's the point that it's on. So I think that the media just goes out there. I don't know where they get their information, to be honest with you, Paul. I, I the, the stuff that is out there, I don't. They talk about Celtic sea salt, and I said, "Where did you get those numbers?" Because none of my lab reports show any of the stuff that they're doing. Well, it's called propaganda. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, even the microplastics when that started to happen, oh, it totally freaked me out. Every call was like, "Oh, you have these microplastics," so I got the article, tried to find the person that wrote the article. They were not even available for me to talk to. They were like some, I think some college students or something that did this white paper. Couldn't get, talk to anybody about the analysis. Um, went to have my salt tested for plastics. Didn't even know where to test it for plastics because the labs that I was using, they didn't test for microplastics, so they couldn't test. Sent it to this one lab that said, oh, boy, we can find plastics in there. But when I got the results back and it was absent, I thought, this is forensic. 
this yeah. is not going to work. I mean, you know what I mean? So I couldn't, I didn't feel confident saying that that's the one. Did lots of research, found a lab in, um, in Europe that did the microplastics analysis, got, the, um, got all the levels back of all the microplastics, and we sent two kilos of each salt to them. And they came back, all the different varieties came back of the number six, which means it's the parts per million. It's so minute that you would have to eat a whole dump truck to get any of that into your body of the consumption. So I have tested. Uh, what was interesting was the salt from France, the gray crystals came back and it was a number six. The fine ground, which is the same thing as the gray crystals, um, but it's just been ground, came back as zero. Um, so I don't even know if I trust these these tests. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I would probably have to have more and more tests done to see the historical data to compare it. But just to show my customers I care and I am taking it serious that this data is circulated there, I found a lab to get analysis on all of my salts. And it's right here. And they're very available. I do not um, put them on the website just because people don't know how to interpret these things very well. So if they ask for it, they do it. But my um, one of my, Ian is the person that answers the phone for me. And I love this man so much. He's been with us for almost 20 years. But um, he really goes deep to try to answer these questions for our customers. And he is like a continuation of the founder, Jacques. Like right now, he's going through all of Jacques' files from way back before there was a computer. Jacques was talking about vaccinations way back then. He had a book that we used to sell called What Price Vaccinations? I mean, he goes way back. He was definitely a channel pioneer <laughs> before his time. And we have all of his files and we're going through all of his things that he did research on. And we feel like we're just channeling his spirit. But Ian went in and did all this research on plastics. We also have this on, a, on our website, this information, so you can really understand more about microplastics. There's more microplastics in the air that we breathe <laughs> yeah then showed up in my analysis <laughs> yes one of the other things that i think is important to consider when you're getting a lab analysis like that is that if they're doing microplastics analysis and they're not doing an extremely good job of cleaning the equipment between analyses then you can end up getting what looks like residues in yours that came from somebody else's product because they haven't cleaned the machinery and this became an issue recently with investigations into the vaccine manufacturers for COVID because they found that a lot of these vaccines were, were um, uh, tainted because they, it was tracked back to poor hygiene of the wow. equipment. And so I think I, I won't say the name because I don't want any lawyers tracking me down, but it was one of the main manufacturers of the COVID vaccines were temporarily shut down because there was a, uh, uh, they analyzed their their logs, their technical logs, and found that they weren't cleaning the equipment at all. And, and it, so they they were getting contaminants due to the lack of hygiene in their uh, laboratories. So if they'll have these problems with vaccine manufacturers, you can rest assured they have it in other labs as well. And I think, you know, you are talking about, like you said, you have to eat a whole dump truck load of salt, which <laughs> you'd either be a very old person or dead from the process. <laughs> But, uh, well, I, I wanted to bring that up just because this is something that's kind of a buzz out there in, in the health community. And like a lot of things, it's just hyped up. But but I, it was important for me that people know that I've already explored this with you. And I, I wanted to bring it up in the podcast so people know that there is the difference between um, propaganda and, and actual fact and that you have tested uh, all your salts very, very thoroughly. When we met and you showed me all these documents before, I'm like, wow, I would have ever, I mean, I, I didn't expect you to be that thorough. And, and like you just showed, there's like four pages of analysis of, you know, probably 80 or a hundred or more different potential things that could be found in there. And, and, and I, I've used your salts for a long time, my whole family, we love them. Um, thank you. And thank you for letting me have this opportunity to share my truth because um, we could go out there and do all these things. We don't have microplastics. We don't have that. I'm just letting the grace of God take this 
and give us the opportunity to share the truth as much as possible through outlets like this, platforms like this. Yeah. Well, with that conversation, let's extend it. What are some of the toxins that anyone buying salt should be concerned about if they're not accessing a source like yours? For example, are there other things we know that can get into salt that we don't want in there? Um, things like that. I don't think that they're, you know, as far as assault that they would be concerned about a toxin, you know, that could actually get into it as much as what they're adding to it to make it a user-friendly salt, such as the free like, uh, agents, anti-caking agents, yeah, anti-caking agents, and then the dextrose and the, you know, iodine and all of that. But as far as um, unwanted things in salt, it would have to be a pretty crude salt to, um, you know, to, you know, to have any kind of t- contaminants. Now, I will say my salt from Portugal, um, I shared this in my book that um, when I went to go, I also visit the source of all of our salts because you just you just don't know. You can't just test the lab. And when I did go to Portugal to get this source of salt, um, it was it wasn't easy, but I I got a bicycle and I rode my bicycle to all the other salt places um, there. And the salt source that we get our salt from in Portugal is the one that is the furthest away from their sewage plant. The infrastructure in Portugal um, was not built properly, so when it floods, the sewage floods too. And so there are other two salt sources there that were lo- that were in Portugal. Um, it was too risky for me to even see them as an alternative source because they were too close to the sewage plant. Right. Well, just on just a side note on that, people would be shit shocked to know how many cities living near water sources use their sewage treatment centers and just dump the waste right into the ocean. Yes. I've looked into that. And, uh, you know, when you look at also how much of the water that's in the city water systems comes right from sewage treatment centers that was in someone's poop and pee 24 hours ago. Right. Um, you know, so it's, it's sort of funny, you know, what, what, what people don't realize they'll, you know, for example, they'll get all freaked out about microplastics and salt, but not realize they're drinking urine and pee that can't have drugs or has farming chemicals filtered out of it and they're fine with that but anyhow so i i just wanted to ask the question just to be thorough that's i i visit the salt sources myself to make sure that there won't be any potential contamination have amazing relationship with each salt you know person i'm actually looking into guatemala now is maybe purchasing their salt flats there because they want to retire so I'm actually looking into doing that also just to continue to expand the quality and have more reassurance that I will always be able to provide a salt source. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. You know, one of the most amazing things we can do for ourselves is actually to get high quality, raw, green, unprocessed vegetables into our body. And one of the things that I find amazing is Organifi's green juice. In fact, it's so amazing. I brought Drew Canoli, the creator of the product, to tell us what is unique about it. Drew, that is an amazing drink. How does it work? What does it do? Why is it so special? Well, first of all, Paul, we went through 52 iterations to get the current formulation of green juice, and we're wow. always increasing the, the value in it. One of the biggest things we did is we actually added 600 milligrams of ashwagandha, full spectrum, So it's a completely higher level of ashwagandha, which actually has been shown in clinicals. And we have dozens of clinicals on this that has actually been shown to lower stress is the big thing. Mm -hmm. Ashwagandha is something I've used for years, even with my clients for stress management. Yep. So when you drink ashwagandha, it puts you in this, in the green juice, it puts you in a meditative space. Mm. And we start at first thing in the morning drinking green juice. And because of the adaptogen in it, Mm -hmm. after 30 to 60 days of continual use, Mm -hmm. it makes such a big difference in your life. You're getting all the vegetables that are Mm -hmm. glyphosate residue free. Yes, They're organic, Mm -hmm. right? Highest quality that you could ever imagine. We got the spirulina and the chlorella, which is so important with all the different frequencies that are Mm -hmm. entering our environment today to help you detox from those. Yes, The green juice is bar none my favorite product at Organifi. And the best part about it is, is it tastes incredible. Yes, it does. It's good. And, and I know my kids love it. So yep. that's always the litmus test. 
Yeah, it's like a it's like a matcha latte that you have first thing in the morning. And with the ashwagandha, lowering your stress, you feel it all day long. It gives you this internal wealth of energy. Mm-hmm. It's just mixed with water. You mix it and, and and now is is the green juice one you can mix with hot water or is it best cold? A lot of people actually prefer it with hot water. Is Some right? people will grab their favorite kind of oat milk or almond milk, something like that. Yeah. And uh, they'll add it to it. And we've gotten thousands of testimonials from all over the world. People start their day with green juice and it makes such a big difference in their life. Well, that's fantastic. So if you want to get your green juice, which I highly recommend, go to Organifi.com. That's Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And on checkout, Living 4D listeners get 20% off if you use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 you will not be disappointed. Can you tell us about your uh, Aquan Matrix and what it does and how it works? I, I know you mm-hmm. sent me some. I, I sampled it, and it's certainly interesting. You can feel a little surge of energy in your body. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's just a liquid, and it's just seawater. And you just drink it just like this. It's so convenient. Um, this was really what brought me to tears when I heard this story, um, in Spain, when I actually went to the Canton company to see how this was manufactured. And the whole story is amazing how, um, this was founded actually by a realtor that bought this, uh, real estate in France and, um, his wife was a chemist and they were cleaning it out. And she saw all these books and these studies on this product and how important it was that seawater can actually, you know, um, get, give, bring all the, all your vital, um, all your vitals back in place if you did a blood transfusion. So this man, gosh, over a hundred years ago, Rene Cantone, um, studied, um, our body and realized that because the ocean has, like I told you before, the magnesium, potassium, calcium, and, um, sodium and chloride, he realized our body, our blood has the same thing. Our, our, the fluid of our body has the same um, cation. So he said, well, isn't that interesting? What would happen if we took seawater and we used it as a therapeutic device to help, you know, optimal well-being? His cases were like psoriasis and um, um, people that were couldn't eat. They were losing a lot of weight. This is way back when. So he started experimenting in the hospitals and they were actually doing blood transfusions in the hospitals with this product successfully but the blood bank didn't like that they couldn't have a piece of the pie right of course and they got him out of the hospital very quickly so they they would not continue that work in there um so and then so he's just started to um do more research how could i bring it to um um to the public so there was another couple companies in france fetasona rome aquacell all these different companies that start bringing in these glass ampules i don't know if you remember the glass ampules we used to carry yeah i do but, and I've, yeah. I've also tested some from other companies as well yeah and so we would brought, bring it in with the glass ampules at one time and the whole concept is that your body cells you know have memory and they're communicating with each other and when you take the Aquan matrix in its bioavailable form, it can go into the cells and immediately communicate to the cells well-being and optimal balance. Because where it comes from in the ocean, the boat has this big tote and it goes out in the ocean. It has the screen on the boat and the screen shows you, it's almost like a neon green. It shows up on the screen and it's where the concentration of the phytoplankton is in the ocean. Mm. That's, that's where the boat stops. And then that's where they take that, that water where there's the concentration of phytoplankton and put it into this big tote, bring it back to the lab. And that's where they mix it with, um, a structured spring water. Um, so it's a perfect ratio balance of the sodium and the chloride and everything. So this one has more of the spring water in it. So it's, um, less sodium concentrated than the dark one. Um, This, the light one is great for every day. It's like, it's just an amazing thing. I could probably, it depends on what I'm doing, but I could take them all day long um, just to keep myself going. My granddaughter had her first seizure when she was two years old. And when she had the seizure, of course, we, um, I asked all these amazing people behind me, do you, do you know of a 
neurologist that we could go to and trust. It's not going to just put her on medication. And we were recommended to go see a Dr. Colbert in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, we went to go see him. And ironically enough, he recommends this product (laughs) to his patients. And the reason he does, and this is what he showed up with Maya, my granddaughter's um, brain scan and all of her blood work and everything, that she has a mitochondria deficiency. And that is probably what was triggering it. So he said, what he's realized is children that are born with a mitochondria deficiency are the ones that usually end up with autism. And the autism comes after they have been introduced to something. It could be Tylenol. It could be a vaccination. It could be anything. So people well, say- Well, anti- antibiotics will wipe out your mitochondria. That's well everything. known. But so these children are born normal, but when they become autistic is is when they are um, introduced to one of these elements that can trigger the autism. So you'll say, well, vaccines are fine. My children have vaccines. They didn't have a problem. Well, they didn't have this mitochondria deficiency, according to Dr. Colbert, was what he's trying to explain. He said, and Maya is a great example. She's never had a shot, never had any of these medications. And they said, if she did, there's a possibility that she could have autism. Or die. Or die. But because she has lived a very natural life, she's having these other seizures and things because of it. And we're, we're handling it for that reason. But she has to have, um, you know, vitamins that are um, more bioavailable because the mitochondria doesn't that. And that's why this is such a phenomenal product. So he, he was telling her to, you know, eat six, eight a day and she craves them. She gets up and she goes, I need my, my aqua matrix. And she takes them, we send them to school with her. Um, you know, it's really great. And that's basically what this product is. It's just phenomenally convenient. Then my niece, she's a soccer coach. Stephanie was just here and she has all her kids in the soccer. And she was giving it to her son and the other kids wanted some. And so now they line up. I want some more of that because they actually feel the difference. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. That's very simple. And that's the, it's called Aquan Matrix, right? Yes. Yes. It's Aquan Matrix. Yeah. And so you can get that from Selena naturally. It's worth trying out. And, um, there, there's two colors, a lighter color and a darker color, which is explained on the website. So mm-hmm. I'm just giving these descriptions because a lot of people may not see the video. They'll hear the podcast without video. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about your super seasonings and why they're important to use for our general health and well-being? Um, mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of people don't understand seasonings, but I love seasonings. And fortunately, our family chef is very good with seasonings and Penny's an amazing chef and she's great with seasonings. And I think a good way to describe seasonings is, is for, for, from my simplistic mind's point of view as a guy who's not a chef is if you think of making a salad dressing with nothing but oil and vinegar and taste it, but then you make the same salad dressing and you put some nice seasonings in it, be it basil or any number of them, it just adds a whole bouquet, not only of flavor, but of, of, of various types of nutrition. So you go from something that's plain and healthy to something that's more um, comprehensive and healthy, but right. still still untainted and full of great stuff. So I just thought it might be nice to hear, you know, you, there must be a reason you sell the seasonings that you do, and maybe you can share a little bit about them. Yeah, well... You know, running a company and um, and just always asking yourself, what are our goals for the next two to three years? Where do we want to expand to? What category in the grocery store do we want to expand to? And, um, you know, salt is in everything. So I could have um, created a cultured vegetable with Celtic sea salt, the chips. You see all the Himalayan chips things and Himalayan yeah. salt. On. And, and so there's a lot of categories that I could have got into, but I realized I want to stay true to um, what the founder Jacques really wanted to do. So we kind of, I got this download of that we are sea and land nutrition. And so we, I decided to say, okay, God, what are the ways that I can not just make a seasoning, just flavor foods and that's it, but how can I um, be able to give something to people that normally would not eat mushrooms or moringa or a seaweed, but I'm sneaking it in there because they're flavoring their food with it. And that's where we came up with our super seasonings. 
here are all the little, all the things that are in the super seasonings. Right. Yeah. Um, there's, what is there? About a dozen of them in there. Oh, or yeah. More. Yeah. It's a very complicated product. It's really, um, it's not easy to make. That powder goes all over the place. So it's, <laughs> it's very challenging to make this and bottle it. But um, we are we are doing it, and I have my production team. They just go, "What has she done to our life by <laughs> developing this product?" It's really, I mean, really, it gives in the air conditioning ducts and everything. And I share these kind of things. You, I don't think the average consumer really understands what goes on behind the development of products and being able to get these products to the consumer. And I just say this and want to share this more with people. So every time they get a product, they bless it and they pray and they just, you know, pray on the people that it's going through the efforts to bring these convenience to them. Yes. We're very detached from what it takes to create wholesome food and wholesome food Mm -hmm. products, because we've got this factory mentality and food just magically shows up in the store and you don't have a clue how it got there or what's in it. You know, what you reminded me of is when I used to be a competitive race car driver, a stock car racer, everybody always loved big crashes. And it used to irritate me that they love people crashing so much because they don't know how much money and how much time it takes to fix a car up after that. And so the the point being is that they're sort of out of touch with the reality of what it takes to own and operate a race car and how much time and money it takes. And they're out of touch with how much time and energy and consciousness it takes to produce really high quality whole food uh, products like you're talking about. Mm, it does. Yes. And we we have three different varieties here. We have a Creole. So that's a little spicy. Um, and then we have the Herby, which is really, it tastes a lot like Herba Mer, And everybody's familiar with that flavor of Herba Mer. And then you know, it has such powerful thing. I went ahead and just did the base, which is all those superfoods with no flavor. Um, so you can put those in your shakes. So you're getting all of that, you know, seaweed, but, but, uh, my niece, she puts it on her foods and she seasons even with this. So, you know, I it love that stuff. A nice flavor. So that is our super seasonings that we are very proud, but we need lots of prayers so we can manufacture that better. <laughs> 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 well, what are why don't you just name some of the herbs and any any tips yeah. you might have on on why those why you selected those and what they offer us? Oh yeah, well, um, well, moringa. You know, moringa is a, yeah is such a powerful powder. I mean, there are people that completely turn around any deficiencies just from eating moringa because it's such a powerful powerful it's, powder. It, it's also considered a very potent anti aging device, and I've read reports of people that drink moringa tea in places like India every day and and you know a lot of the people writing about it say it seems to have an anti-aging quality I know my soul tells me to drink it almost every day Hmm. that's interesting like I said I'm drinking it right now I drink the Tulsi moringa tea oh yeah so it's it's also an energizer it lifts your vitality up it's it's a pretty amazing superfood. I'm I'm blessed to have my niece have a farm in Senegal with it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and have that source. And then the seaweeds. Uh, we have kelp and dulse and wakame. And seaweeds are just very high in iron and mm-hmm. iodine and in calcium. And then we have the nettle leaf in there, nettle leaf powder, mm-hmm. which is a really great adaptogen. Just helps to build the immune system. Um, uh, let's see, we have all these mushrooms, lion's manes, turkey tail, uh, reishi, and um, we just know that those are the adaptogens that just can help with everything. Each one has its own thing, helps with mm. stress and digestion. Neurogenesis. Um, yes. And then we have chiso leaf powder. Chiso is just a really good red blood builder. Um, uh, raspberry leaf to help with digest- digestion. Dandelion herb um, also to help with alkalinity and digestion. All these were picked with an intention of what they help with. I wanted to put ashwagandha, but I just couldn't get the flavor. <laughs> oh. It just it just made the flavor really bad. So I thought they're going to have to get their ashwagandha someplace else. <laughs> so I, 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 use, I vaporize raspberry leaf. It, it actually is a nice lifting herb to vaporize. I'll have to try that. Wow. Yeah, it's qu- it's pretty cool. That's neat. And ashwagandha, I vaporize too because of its uh, ad- adaptogenic oh, really? properties. And, and ashwagandha tea, interestingly, has a nice natural sweet taste to it. So 
I, I'd be interested to know how it was changing the flavor in a, in a way that you didn't think was positive. It was kind of bitter. Oh, is that right? Maybe it's the because powder was it, bitter. Maybe it's coming from a raw source. But I, I use uh, Dr. Nick from Essential Oil Wizardry's uh, ashwagandha tincture, and it actually tastes good in water, and it also tastes good in uh, and I you know when I mix it with my herbs and tobacco, it, and it gives me quite a, a nice, noticeable stress relieving effect at the wow. end of the day. I'm gonna have to try that. Yeah. Well, that's really good. Um, did you want to cover any more? Or did you kind of give us the, the herbs there? I gave you the herbs. Yep. I think you got those. Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've all heard of the benefits of bone broth, but I bet you don't know about bone broth protein powder. I found an awesome bone broth protein powder with Paleo Valley, and I asked Autumn Smith if she'd explain why hers is so good from Paleo Valley. Well, like you said, collagen is basically the fountain of youth, and most of us are not getting enough of it in our diet because maybe we don't have time to simmer bones on a regular basis. And so we created our powder to make getting the benefits of collagen for your joint health, for your gut health, for your mental health, really, really simple. And we sourced it from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished bones. So it is a beef bone broth protein powder that you can literally put in everything. It's tasteless. I add it to my son's smoothies. I put it into his desserts. You can even put it in soup and get all the benefits of collagen without all of the time and energy and investment. So all you have to do to check it out is go to our website at paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15. That's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 at checkout. And I hope your family loves it. I know you'll love it. Keep your body healthy. Keep your kids healthy. And let's make the world a better place with Paleo Valley. Enjoy. As we were preparing for the podcast, which was probably a couple of months ago now, I can't remember a while back, but you explained some of the real challenges you've had with the politics and corporate interests so you can retain or remain in business selling quality products direct to the consumers. I, I think it'd be interesting for the audience to hear about the kind of excuse the language, but horse shit you've had to put up with. Mm. Well, I'm, I, I'm not alone. Anybody that has played the game of getting their products all the way into mass distribution, this is just part of the things you have to do. But, um, you know, we started with the, with the grain and salt society and we had our catalog and our newsletter and we had gosh, over 4,000 different products in the catalog, but this was before Amazon. So, um, when we started the newsletter, people would write about things and I'd say, well, I was frustrating them. They need to have a solution at their fingertips. I, that was one thing um, I thought it was hard as a mother to be today with the internet. You don't have that problem, but to be educated and then you got to go find out where to get it. So I didn't want that newsletter, my newsletter to be like that. So when I would write about it, anything in the newsletter, I'd always want to try to find a source or a solution to offer to them. And immediately the sales would go crazy from those articles, in the newsletter. So we had that many products in our, um, catalog at one time. Well, we had a flood and um, we were getting ready to go to print and everything was destroyed. I had no flood insurance. There was the, it flooded my entire company and we didn't have anything. So um, I had to very quickly pivot and this is <laughs> before COVID or anything, but this was a pivot that I had to do very quickly. So how was I going to pivot um, with no flood insurance and just lost every single thing and just went through a divorce and you know, paid, um, bought the company out. So I was scared to death of what to do, but, you know, tapped into God. And it's amazing how your spirit guides can guide you even in the most stressful times. Oh, went, yeah. went and met with the FEMA, the, um, the, uh, people that were helping to, um, give you a loan with the SBA loan, sat there in line for hours and hours and hours. And I was in the wrong line. They said, no, you, your business, you need to go of that line. So I went and they said, you need, I can't give you anything without a business plan. I said, give me a piece of paper because I'm not leaving. <laughs> they gave me a piece of paper and I wrote my business plan and gave it to them. I said, this is what I'm going to do. We used to have 4,000 products in a catalog and newsletter. So I'm going to pivot now and I'm going to go into distribution and really just focus on the salt and get it out there more into the distribution. So that was the first um, thing that God was saying, you might want to start pivoting the company and do other things. And then of course, Amazon was 
was born. And there's no way I can compete with Amazon. We would promote a lot of these products in our catalog. And then these people would put it on Amazon. And then we would, you know, we couldn't sell it anymore because people can get an Amazon. So um, to transition from being a catalog and newsletter and only selling to our members, which we had over 80,000 um, subscribers to our newsletter at one time, we had to figure out what were we going to do. And that's when I wrote the plan and said, we're going to focus on salt and I'm going to get salt mass per, um, saturate out there into the world, you know, into distribution. I had not a clue what that meant, but what it meant was, um, going, we were already in every single whole foods that there was, and we had developed that business just on our own with our relationships. Um, and also because of people like you that went out there and said, you guys need to eat Celtic sea salt. So the demand started to grow. It was no advertising, nothing that we did. It was just because these beautiful angels that are influencing people to eat better started to tell people to eat Celtic sea salt. So whole foods, all of whole foods has our salt. And so I met with the broker and sitting there and they go, yeah, we can do this for 5% of all sales. And I went of new sales that go, oh no, no sales that you've already done. I said, I'm going to give you 5% of sales that I have accumulated all these years. Well, yeah, that's how it works. All right. That was hard to digest. And they said- That's uh, criminal. Yeah. And you also have to go through distribution if you really want this to happen. So you have to go through UNFI and KHE. So they said, and, and they get 25%. And I'm going, oh, okay. So right there's 30% just like that. So well, now we know why food's so expensive. Amen. There's a lot of third, there's a lot of middlemen. So- at the, and just in one day, this is October of 2011, we decided to go into distribution and we did it. And, you know, we went from um, all of our wholesale stores were like huge. They were growing and growing to they were just zero. They weren't selling any more direct. It was all going through distribution with that less 30 percent margin and all these free fills and everything else that you have to pay to get in there. It was so hard because I had to go from, I mean, our revenue went down almost $400,000 just because of a different channel of distribution. Wow. And that's what we had to do. But we're not alone. We weren't picked on. That's the game that people, that's what you have to do. If you want to get your products out there, that is what you have to do. But I do know this, um, the people that get hurt the most in distribution are the manufacturers, the vendors. The stores, they got their back all covered because of their free fills and everything else. The brokers, they got their back covered. The, everybody has their back covered, but um, it's the vendors that have to pay their way to get the products out there. And you I mean you, the producer? The producer. The people that are providing the product have to really pay to get the products out there. Unless you're a vaccine manufacturer, then you're safe. You can poison anybody and there's no ramifications. And the crazy thing about that one is all these people... And I just came to this conclusion because I've been going in different circles of my friends and I'm thinking, and when I meet someone, they go, yeah, I just got the, you know, the jab. And I go, really, you won't eat a uh, apple that is not organic, but you will get that. I, yes. you know, I just never, I just not getting the two. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, you, because you are endowed with common sense, which unfortunately isn't very common anymore. <laughs> right. So, um, but at the end of the day, the politics and everything, I'm not a victim. And, and in that, I just strive to do it. Right now, we're doing very well in all of those channels. Um, it just was very hard for me to digest. And I felt um, there was a little bit of victim. I felt like a victim in it. Like I have no control over this. And they're taking all of our money. And they're taking all of our profit. But you know what? I, I was victorious in it. I played the game. We made it through it, and it's the beginning that is the really hard thing to do. Um, but if someone's out there developing a product today and they're trying to get it out there, I'm going to say you've got to develop that big brand demand first through social media or whatever, then start to play with the distributors and everything. Because if you don't, they they can you can pay a slotting fee to get it on the shelf, but you can be off that shelf the next two months because another person can play that sl slotting fee and get your space. So. That's my advice for anybody getting out there. And that's the woes that we went through with, um, you know, the politics of distribution and, and all of that. But um, I'm not a victim in it at all. It's just the way you play the game. Yeah. It, it, you, know, in, you know, in all honesty, having studied life and everything related to it my whole life, it's quite safe to say that life itself is a great big game. 
Yeah, it really is. And it's funny you say that because I shared this in my book that, um, for one thing, being a parent is, is, is like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> Uh, that's that's like a big game. Being a parent of a special needs child is a, another game. And then being a parent of a child that has dietary, um, you know, sensitivities is even is even harder. And um, the hard thing, I think, is just going through and sifting through the truths to try to find the truths to support all of the game that you're playing. Right. In fact, I, I overlooked that. I wanted to ask you, what inspired you to write your book, In Her Element? And what is the key storyline you are sharing so listeners know what's in it for them? Sure. Um, here's here's the book. And um, the the picture, my publisher said, Selena, we can't use that picture because it's from your cell phone. I said, I don't really care. Just use it anyway because it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the book was inspired because Jacques' book is as amazing as it is. There were still some information in Jacques' book that, I couldn't speak and um, behind it because it was Jacques' writings. There was also some things that needed to be updated that I didn't feel it was right for me to update his writings and his research and his book. So I had to write a new book because all the customers that ask about these things and we answer that same question over and over and over again. So we're sitting in a marketing meeting and one of my employees, Sharon, my purchaser, says, yeah, write a book and call it... Um, uh, your body's many cries for minerals, just like <laughs> Dr. Mandela, your body's many cries for water. And I went, Oh yeah, let's do that. I start writing the book and I thought I am not writing anything that everybody could not do a Google search and find. So why am I bothering to write all of this information? So I said, you know, I really prayed about it. And the book started to, um, morph into more of, the story of the company and the integrity of the company, not so much um, what is phosphorus good for, what is sodium good for. So it morphed into just my story and um, telling how the company started. The first two chapters is all about Jacques' research and what he's saying about sea salt. Um, and then the rest of it is really just how the company has been um, has grown. So we're sitting in another meeting and I said, it's just, I don't want to wire it all the science. So Ian, one of my employees says, what about in her element? I mean, then that mm. makes sense. Cause it's like your story in her element. I said, okay, I'll take it. I have great employees. And so, um, so I titled it that. And as I started writing it, it really just kind of went into the whole story of the company, the challenges that we've been through, um, the flood that we experienced, the brand infringement. There was a company that came and took the Celtic Sea Salt brand and to the Supreme Court to try to make it be a generic term because they didn't like that I was capitalizing the market with this brand. I don't know. It cost me over $90,000, but it was my brand. I own intellectual property. Yes. But what, what the attorney said, oh, that just gives you the right to fight for it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big, there's the game again. And of course. And that was a big one. That was, oh, talk about, I could have fallen into that victim place really easy, Paul. I really could have. And I went to a Louise Hay conference and I was in the middle of this. This this lawsuit was almost 18 months long. And I was just really, what am I supposed to do? I was already like $70,000 into this. And this person that was suing me had a lot deeper pockets than I did. So I know that they could have gone on for a lot long, long time. And um, I went to this one lecture and it was just about, you know, the word surrender. And I surrendered it, let it go because it was sucking the life out of the company. We oh, weren't yeah. growing. We were in defense mode. We weren't in growth mode. And um, I said, I'm going to just, I called the attorney. I says, okay, I'm going to stop this. He goes, stop what? He goes, they sued you. <laughs> you can't just stop it. You have to pay now to get the lawsuit to stop. And I went, Oh my God. You've got to be kidding me. That's like somebody comes and takes your car and you go, I have to go pay to get it back. Yeah. yeah. Because you have to prove it's yours. Um, so going through that, that's in the book. Um, uh, he, a mentor of mine that um, he owned the brand uh, fudge sickle, popsicle, Kona coffee. He was an amazing mentor and um, he was going to help me build the brand and he was murdered. Wow. That's in, that's in the book. And then, um, of course, the birth of my son, he was born, you know, in 1979, and he was born at home. 
And uh, he was born with cerebral palsy. And um, I've always wanted to tell this story because I believe that um, people can gain and learn more from stories than they can from data and information. Yes. Yeah. And so that's why I really felt it was important that I shared that story also about how he crossed over, how I was, um, you know, Catholic, then born again, Christian. And so every time a psychic would want to talk to me, I say, Oh, no, that's from the dark side. I'm not supposed to talk to psychics, you know, they're from the dark side. So I would never talk to them. But there was a lot of psychics, says, but there's somebody who wants to talk to you. So there were people who would approach me saying that my son, because my son, when he was born, he couldn't talk. So he was lived to be 28 years old, and he never spoke a word. He was born with cerebral palsy. So there was, um, from the other side, from the other dimension, there was always um, a message wanting to get across to me from this experience. And so finally, um, I got a call from one of my old employees. She was my marketing girl at the time. And she said, and I hadn't seen her probably in two years. And she says, oh, I got to meet with you. I've talked to you. I just had the most amazing experience. And I said, sure, let's have lunch. So we were having lunch. And um, she said, I went and saw this psychic. And I said, you're kidding, a psychic? Oh my gosh. And she said, yeah, but what kept happening when I went to go see the psychic was I kept thinking about Dominique. That's my son's name. And the psychic kept saying, there's a message trying to come in and it has nothing to do with you, but you know, the person. So she says, I thought I would call you Selena. I said, give me the phone number. And this, at this time, Dominique was 28 years old. He'd never spoken a word. He had the body, uh, capabilities of a three month old infant. So wow. if you can get a visual of a 28 year old that only can do what a three month old can do, you know, his bones were coming through his spine and there was a lot of, he, he was, it was just really wearing on him being in this body. Right. And, um, and I didn't know what to do. He didn't talk Dominique. What do you want me to do? I don't know what to do. So I called this psychic and I says, I have a son that doesn't talk. Can you get a message? Can you talk to him? Can you see what he wants me to do? And she says, I can only surrender and give it to God, but let's have a session. So on February 20th, um, I went to meet with her and um, we sat down. But she said at the same time, these messages were coming through even before I came in. She goes, this person has been wanting to get a message to you. And it was Dominique's guides and his, you know, his higher self was trying to get a message to me. I sat down with this psychic and she recorded the whole thing. And she said that your souls agreed to do this before you came here. Your soul, there were two souls there, and they said one needs to come here and have a special needs, and the other one is going to be the caregiver. And you're going to agree to do this. And as Dominique raised his hand, I'll be the special needs and I'll be the caregiver. And there was something I was supposed to learn in being his caregiver. In my belief, I believe when you're making these agreements, you don't look at it as a hardship having special needs because you're already in this other dimension and it's just a blink of an eye to come here in the physical. So you make these agreements and my, I don't have proof of this, but I feel like you make these agreements and you come in, you live these agreements and these are fulfilling either someone else's purpose or your own purpose, you know, of something you're supposed to do. So that's what Dominique volunteered to do. Paul, when she said this, it was as if I remembered the conversation. I had wow. lived 28 years of guilt thinking I did this to my son because I was a 19 year old that had him at home. And so I felt like I had done this to him. But in the reading, he said, mom, you did not do this to me. We came here to do this together. And now that it's over, I can leave. And I'm so glad you got it because we'd have to come and do it again <laughs> if right. you didn't get it. And so I got it. And Paul, two days later, I woke up on Saturday morning. This the other day it was I saw the psychic on Thursday. Saturday morning I woke up and I called my son's caregiver and I because I would pick him up every Friday and drop him off every Sunday because I would keep him on the weekends about three years at the end of his life. And she said, Yeah, you can come and get him. And I said, Well, he's gonna die today. And she goes, What? <laughs> he's not sick. Well, I don't know what you're saying. I said, I'm supposed to say this. So I told her that he was going to die, I told his sisters, my two daughters, he's going to die today. I went to this health food store and they said, what do you do today? I said, my son's dying today. I said, oh, you turn the machines off? I said, no, he's dying. It was like the Holy Spirit wanted me to keep saying that, keep saying that because it was part of the story. Well, the psychic said I need to go get some crystals before he crosses over because she said crystals help people move from this dimension to the next one. So I went and got some crystals and um, I stopped at this uh, crystal store. And when I walked in, I said, I need crystals. And the guy says, well, the lady that 
Stocks Are Crystals is right behind you. She came in from Florida today and she can help you. And she helped me. She said, I can see Dominique and he is ready to move on. The psychic, this lady doing the crystal said this to me in the store. And, and the phone rings and it's the caregiver and says, Dominique's breathing is really weird. I want you to hurry up and get here. So I walk in, I finally make it to Hot Springs, walk in the door. And um, my niece, Stephanie, the one that you saw here, her mom passed away when she was 42 years old. And when she died, she said, I promise you, I will be there for Dominique when he comes. When wow. I walked into that room, I could smell her. Wow. Yeah. And um, so I walked into the room. He's laying there and he looked over at me and a little tear came. And I said, I remember, Dominique, you're free now. You can go. I laid him on my chest with the crystals on the windowsill, put some music on. And I said, I'm going to put a crystal in your hand, Dominique, and you can leave a message with all your loved ones, your sisters, your grandparents, your everyone. I'll give each one of them a crystal from you. And I laid him there and put music on. And um, he took his last breath. He just went back like this, opened his mouth, and it was done. Wow. That's a, a very, very uh, profound story on many levels. And uh I'm proud of you for overcoming your Christian dogma. Or you might not have got the message. I would have had to do it again. <laughs> and you know, that that's quite important in, with what's going on in the world today, because a lot of people are resisting messages that are very important because it goes against their programming. And mm -hmm. I think when the world's going through a transition, if you don't be open to possibilities, even when they challenge you, then you actually resist the flow of reality and it's like somebody who doesn't believe in wearing uh sun protection who moves to the middle of the desert and now is getting burned because they're got a belief that might have worked in british columbia but doesn't work in um death valley california you know so we I think it's just important to always be open. And I, I tell people any belief worth living is worth challenging. And you obviously challenged your own belief and look, look how important that was for you to fulfill that soul contract. And my life was a little bit of these interesting contrasts from food to spirituality, you know, just ways of what I was born and raised to believe. And then what I was able to, um, shift and change and believe differently. But when you said be open, it makes me think of that little saying where a parachute is no good. If it's closed, it's only good if it's open. <laughs> and, and I think that's kind of the, uh, just the analogy of life. And just, just, I think that that closed mindedness can really cause a lot of suffering in our life. Oh, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. No question. I mean, I won't even go into what, wants to come out of me on that or will sidetrack the whole podcast, but I think <laughs> it's a good lesson for everyone. I'm glad you shared the story. Thank you. You know, you know, it is, as you know, Selena, better than most, it's very challenging being the parent of a special needs child. And you have a lot of experience in this reality. And today there's a huge increase in the levels of autism and um, an onslaught of children with special needs and family members largely due to from my research to vaccine injuries and other factors such as environmental toxicity, uh, parents having such a low level of health and vitality that they're not able to basically reproduce a healthy child. Um, could you share some wisdom and inspiration to help special needs families? Yes. I First thing I want to share is um, when you look at these children, make sure you don't, you do not look at them with pity. Mm. It's the worst emotion you can give to these children. So you have to look at them with gratitude. Mm. You have to really say, I cannot believe that God saw that I was equipped to deal with this. Right. And I'm going to use God's power to deal with this. It's not an accident that these families have come together, that the parents of the special needs have these children. It's because they were divinely chosen and they're going to do the very best, but don't make it something that is not going to um, 
make a positive impact. The one thing that I know when I first got Dominique's diagnosis was I got into a bad depression. I was having a hard time getting out of it. And somebody gave me a book called Happiness is a Choice. And I'm so glad that I was blessed with that book when he was like three years old, because I could have chosen a path of a lot of misery and it would have been very justifiable, but it's not going to get you anywhere. It, you know, your emotions, your thought, and you can have gratitude with everything. With my son, Dominique, I would just have gratitude that he wasn't too big for me to pick up. You can find some gratitude in every experience, but please know that you were divinely chosen if this is an experience that you are having and you can make the best of it by being a light in this experience. What's interesting is when you are chosen and when you have a happy life, you can't be as much of a light to show the power of, of God's work as you can when you're carrying what do you want to call your cr- cross like this? What are, I don't like to call it a burden, but when you're carrying an experience like this, you have a better opportunity to show a light because people go, how can she be happy? How can she still be like this? So right. just look for the gratitude, look for the things that are good. And there is good in everything. There is good in everything. I mean, I mean, the people that have come into my life because of my son, he never spoke a word, but that guy being alive for 28 years taught me more than any human on this earth and see what these children can teach you. Don't blame why they are this way. It's not going to serve you. It's not going to do anyone any good. Find the gratitude in it and embrace it and say, Hey, you know what? We're going to make the best of this. What are we going to do? And actually tap into their higher self too. So both of your, your higher guides can talk to each other and see what are we supposed to do with this experience that we have here in this lifetime. Yeah, that's good advice. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to share Bioptimizer's new excellent sleep support product called Sleep Breakthrough. I've used it and my kids use it and it's really good. It helps me sleep. It tastes great. And since it's a new product, I've got Matt here from Bioptimizers, who's one of the co-creators of the product, to give us some more information on how and why it works so well. So Matt, how does it work so well? Yeah, first of all, Sleep Breakthrough is a drink. You mix it about an hour before your target bedtime. You're going to feel your nervous system and your brain calm down. Your sleep latency will drop. Your desire to fall asleep will improve. Your REM's going to improve. Your heart rate will slow down and you're going to wake up feeling awesome. The way it works is we're targeting five different pathways. The first one is we want to optimize your natural melatonin production. We do that by giving your body the building blocks that it needs. The first one is magnesium bisglycinate. It's been shown to naturally increase melatonin levels. Then we add cofactors like P5P, which is a bioactive form of vitamin B6. Second, we have four different sleep minerals that will all improve the quality of your night's sleep. First is potassium, helps quiet down neurons. Second, calcium, which improves REM and also helps transform tryptophan into serotonin, which is a building block for melatonin. Third is zinc, which is really important for the metabolism of melatonin, again, it's a cofactor. And it also calms down the nervous system. And then last, again, is the magnesium bisglycinate. The third pathway is GABA, which is the molecule of chill. When they looked at insomniacs, they found that insomniacs were about 30% lower in GABA than people without sleep disorders. We tested pretty much every GABA on the market. We found that pharma GABA was the most powerful. The fourth pathway is we're targeting the brain. We're targeting brain waves. There's two molecules we can use to increase alpha brain waves and decrease beta brain waves, which is when people are struggling to fall asleep, the monkey brain's active, the hamster wheel's going, is because they have too many beta brain waves going, L-theanine and pharma GABA increase alpha brain waves. And the last thing is glycine. Using three grams of glycine, which helps lower body temperature, it promotes faster sleep onset, extends REM. And my favorite part about it is if there's a night where you don't get enough sleep, you'll actually wake up feeling better and more refreshed the next day. That's awesome. Sounds like you did a lot of research to put a real beautiful combination of synergistic supplements and ingredients together to really help people sleep. I know it works very well. And I know one of the things that's lovely is my kids love it because it tastes great. Mm -hmm. And we all need more sleep, especially in the buzz of the world today. So if you want to get your sleep breakthrough, go to sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash C-H-E-K in lowercase. 
And to get your 10% discount on your sleep breakthrough, use the code capital P, capital A, capital U, capital L10. That's Paul10 on checkout. Enjoy sleeping much better with Sleep Breakthrough. Selena, since the COVID pandemic kicked off and to this very minute, there are a lot of nefarious forces working to degenerate the family unit, disrupt the needs and rights for parental control over what are truly adult decisions such as vaccination, sex education, sex exposure, pornography, and more, and giving children the rights to change their sex and use puberty blockers without parental consent. Personally, I feel this is exceedingly dangerous and something that men, particularly fathers, should be standing up against, but don't seem to be stepping into their roles as protectors. The number of male and female physicians that have exposed their own families and themselves and countless patients to vaccine mandates without taking the responsibility to look into what's in them, evaluate any science or lack thereof, and who, uh, and, and, so therefore, they're also playing dangerous games with the Hippocratic Oath, which is first do no harm and their moral responsibilities is one of the examples I could give as deep concerns. Uh, also, many of these doctors and nurses are also parents and aren't thinking about this before they inflict their own families with these types of situations. So, Selena, with these issues in mind, I'd love to hear what your values are as a mother and a woman, and why do you feel, or do you feel, that women need to step forward and help bring balance back to the family unit, social groups, society, and culture, and ultimately help us move forward toward world harmony, and what would happen if women don't? And the reason I say this is because we're in a, we have been for a long time in a very dangerously patriarchal society. We have a very scientific materialist mindset. It's driven largely by men, powerful billionaires, um, many of them not psychologically very healthy, such as Rockefellers and Gateses and people like this that, that really, I don't think, have humanity's best interest at heart. So why I'm concerned is because I feel like if we don't make a shift towards more of a matriarchal influence and get mothers that do actually have the common sense and the sense of connection to children and the willingness to educate people, not necessarily as experts, but as mothers, I have seen some amazing video footage of women going to school boards and city town hall meetings and even legislation and, and even some of the women that are lawyers for the children's health defense. One of them came to one of my workshops. And I see that when women really use their God-given feminine energy and step into this role of educators and protectors, that it can help bring balance to men. And men tend to be very rational, logical, and, and detached from their emotions, yet Women are much more capable of picking up the emotional news and the emotional weather report and helping men see what they don't see because they're often so driven and so focused often on just making money and not seeing the the rest of the picture. I, I, and I'm not trying to push you in any direction. I'm just, I just, as a man and as a father and as an educator, I just feel compelled to ask you, what do you feel the role of women is right now? And, and what could you suggest that they do to help be more proactive so that we're not so subject to these dark, often tyrannical forces that don't have any connection to the Hippocratic Oath? That's really great. Um, first of all, I've noticed that um, there's a pendulum of, you know, male and female. So I've always wanted to find that balance and not find, you know, it has to be so feminine to be able to compensate for all the masculine things that have been done. Mm -hmm. So you used harmony and balance in that question. And that's what I believe that we, we can strive for the most. I am not those kind of um, 
women or people that go into um, a organization and try to make a difference. I am one that tries to create a new instead of change and old. That's just my personality. So I think as a business owner and as a mom and a grandma, we need to start creating a lot more communities. Right. That, I think that's important. Yes, that we can all talk. And, we have to um, do the anti-social yeah. distancing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, you know, it's funny because um, I've talked to some other women and three other women just recently are their, their children's soccer coach. The mom is this children's soccer coach. And so I'm thinking, well, where are the men? Where, you know, what, what's happening here? But men are picking kids up from school now. And that, you know, when I had little kids, that was not in the, they didn't do that then. So I feel like there is a balance of the feminine and masculine um, balancing it out. As far as, you know, the schools, I've never been a person that feels like it is a school's responsibility to educate our children on sexuality. It's none of their business personally. (laughs) So I've always been a pretty big advocate of of that, but um, you know, that's the school system and I'm not sure how we are going to combat the school system and get them to stop it. So in the meantime, I think we just have to just talk to our children more and more and have communities where we can all talk to each other, you know, about these things. And that's one thing I'm grateful for the COVID thing was it started to realize that the people that you are, um, you know, associating with and and making your tribes with, Um, more than ever, they have to be really like-minded because there's such a contrast in the beliefs, you know, in it. And I've noticed that. It's so big. And um, so in that, build those strong communities of like-minded people. And there's so many of them. And I think that is going to be the future of our existence. It is. is, Yeah. Is small communities. And, and, you know, for whatever reason, we went from, you know, the... um, you know, from um, the way it used to be up until today, but look how far we've come. I mean, women couldn't vote. Um, I mean, we've come a long way and there's still a lot of things that are broken and it's big things, you know, the educational system, the financial system, all of those things, but we don't have to destroy them. We just have to create a new, don't use any energy to destroy anything. Just use the energy to create the new and the, and the people will come, the like-minded people will come. Yeah, that's the principle of alchemy right there. Transformation, yeah. transformation, not necessarily destruction, but transformation. Yes, yes. So that that would be my my advice. I don't think that it's, I don't know if it's good advice, but that's my take on it. Those are my values as far as all of that goes. I think that um, the school system has tried to take the responsibilities of things that parents are supposed to have the responsibility to do. You know? I, I've seen at least two or three videos of shown by parents that have actually gone into the library because either their child came home with a book out of the library or they somehow just found it. But some of the sex books that are showing up in elementary school, kids, public uh, school libraries are just shocking. I mean, it's just stuff. I'm like, who in their right mind would put that in there? Mm. And and this is not a unique thing. This is happening all over the place. And uh, I have not the, the 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 fingers point back to the to the school boards and the directors of the schools. But it just it just there, there is some very I don't even have the right words for it, but nefarious forces working to disrupt the social cohesion of a healthy family and and. Uh, and you know, Paul, what's challenging is how does how do people vote? How do they make their vote count? Because when I go through these line of candidates and all these things, Republican and Democrat and all those things, it's it's just scattered. So I might believe in this, but I don't believe in that. And I might believe in this, but I don't believe in that. And I'll tell you, I don't have the answer there, you know, for those big things, you know. But like I say, um, I remember, I can't remember who made president once and I was in a really good mood. And this lady says, how can you be in a good mood? That person just made president. I says, well, because God is really my president. I, my board of directors, my everything. So to me, I don't live my life thinking that these people have more control over me than God does. Right. Yeah. That, that's certainly a healthy disposition. Um, I won't go into the 
politics of what's going to happen if we don't get involved. But, um, you know, when people start giving children ice cream cones for getting vaccinated without their parents' permission and, and things like that, um, as, as much as I love God and understand your perspective, I think that, you know, the Quakers have a beautiful saying, pray and move your feet, mm -hmm. which means, you know, we can't just leave it to God. We've got to participate because we're in this game called life and we have to do our part. Otherwise, it just ends up being a lot of praying to God and hoping things will change while people keep living with the same passive approach to things. And I don't think that's a healthy religious attitude. I think it's, it's, um, you know, it's childish. Um, but anyhow, I appreciate you sharing what you did share. I I'm curious if you looked into a metaphorical crystal ball, which psychics use for seeing the future and witches do, how do you envision people's commitment to their health changing? Or what do you feel our collective future would be around health in the next five to 20 years? In other words, if you take it, what, what you see going on in the world around people's orientation towards health, caring for their bodies, the rates of diseases are through the roof. And you know, paradoxically, we have the most expensive medical system in the world. But I was recently told by a, a physician that I interviewed, I, last time I looked at the statistics was years and years ago when I wrote my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy in 2004. And then we were ranked 37th in the world. But he says we're now ranked 64th in the year in the world for quality of health control, but we have the most expensive medical system. And you know, just to give you an example, when Donald Trump gave the $2 trillion stimulus package for people that were suffering financially from COVID, I said, you know, first of all, you don't know what the return on that investment is. That's not a gift. That's, that's, you're going to be paying for that in many ways. Second of all, what would happen if we put $2 trillion into basic health education? It would wipe out a huge number of the chronic diseases because people would actually learn how to do the kinds of things I share in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, like just basic daily health practices, the importance of sleep, the importance of real food, the importance of not overstimulating yourself so that you can't sleep properly and you burn yourself out, the importance of getting enough movement every day, the importance of breathing, and just very, very basic things, which we have almost zero education on. People don't normally start getting educated until they get sick and the medical system's not working, then they have to come find people like me and you that have figured it out on our own. So I'm just curious, you, you know, you've got a long whole life of being involved in all things health. What do you see happening in the next five to 20 years? I see more people um, connecting the dots that you are what you eat, you are what you think. And you are what you, how you move and everything. I think more people are being educated to learn that. But I also think that, and I think that the people that are not embracing that aren't going to be around that much longer. Right. They just come from old school. You know what I mean? I just kind of feel like they're whatever reason. Um, so I really do believe that I, I, I'm a Pollyanna kind of personality anyway. So I do believe that um, COVID brought a lot of distrust to the medical community that maybe never would have happened if it didn't happen. And so for that, I mean, I have a friend um, that I just saw and he started having tingling in his hands and his legs and his fingers. And um, he went to his doctor and he said, what's going on? And they said, oh, it's probably long COVID symptoms, whatever. So he said, go to this neurologist. He went to the neurologist and this is a guy in Florida. And he said, um, did you get the vaccine? He said, yeah. And he says, this is more vaccine than COVID. And I said, wait a minute, a neurologist told you that the vaccine, he goes, yeah. He goes, this neurologist actually said, I'm personally embarrassed that I've been recommending people to get the vaccine. Yes. Good. Well, that means so there are doctors that are going, cause they're intelligent. They just, they got, they, they got, what do you call it? Duped. They got <laughs> whatever. Forced. They, yeah, but they are. And he even said to this guy, I can't believe that they're actually bringing this out for children to get it. So I believe that the doctors are, there are some doctors waking up and it's because of COVID and, and the irresponsible way that they handled 
the whole vaccine thing. They're, they're not stupid and they're seeing it. I also believe that we are coming to understand that um, food, nutrition, exercise is so important. But if you don't have your thoughts right, <laughs> none of that is going to work. So I do believe we're, we are coming into a more of an understanding as, a, as humanity to understand the power of our thoughts and the magic that our thoughts can create. But I have a Pollyanna kind of personality and all those, all these bad health and all the medicine, the pharmaceuticals and everything, they're not going to last because they're, they're causing death. They're not causing life. So I don't think they're going to really be around. They're not going to survive. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think so. And unfortunately, a lot of the people that subjected themselves to the experiment aren't going to be around because the statistics are shocking. Um, to put it mildly, more people have died from the COVID vaccines, which technically are not vaccines, than all other vaccines in the last 50 years combined. And so it, it's sort of self-selecting itself out of public access. But meanwhile, they still continue to, to try to push them and be tricky with ads now saying that the symptoms that you're getting are good because it means that the vaccine's working. I'm like, I've never seen such a level of of manipulation and spin doctoring. It's 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 almost as though the medical system has taken a lesson from the politicians on how to hoodwink people and get them to pay for all this, let alone the rest of the story. Um, speaking of of doctors becoming more honest, somebody very close to me developed some very unpleasant symptoms after being vaccinated and ended up with these nasty sores all over their skin. Mm -hmm. And it took five doctors um, because they never had anything like this prior to the vaccination. And every single doctor said, no, it has nothing to do with the vaccines. But finally, the fifth doctor admitted, oh, yes, I've seen many, many cases of this. And unfortunately, you're probably going to have to live with this for the rest of your life because the Nobody knows how long it takes to detoxify those vaccines. And so um, the point is there are finally doctors that are getting honest yes. out there. And mm -hmm. um, you may have to go to five to find one. But eventually, mm -hmm. you, you, if you search hard enough, the truth will come to the light. Here's a question that I sometimes ask, but I felt compelled to ask you. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you give the world as a message right now as your goodbye message? That uh, I'm just going to be reborn again into another dimension. So please don't be sad. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that um, really just try to look at everybody through God's eyes, you know, just really try to have more compassion, empathy in your life. Very good. Where can people learn more about you, find your products, your book? Um, you can go to selenanaturally.com or celticseasalt.com. Great. Well, everybody, that, that was a fantastic exploration of sea salt, herbs, and life, really, a very powerful expose of life. And, and also, you can see Selena is a very strong woman who's able to anchor herself in her spiritual philosophy and it's carried her through life very beautifully, which it has for me as well. And as a gift to all of you, Selena is well uh, willing to offer you each a 20% discount on, is it all products, Selena? Yes. All products. If you use the code CHECK20, so that's all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. And she's going to give anybody that uses the discount a free copy of her book in her element. And that is a very lovely, generous offer. So, uh, Selena, what a, an amazing time. I, I, I so enjoyed our last visit together. I was just itching to do this podcast just so I could hang out with you again. And just, you know, I, I just love being with people that really are committed to helping people live a better life and have devoted their life to bringing good foods, good products. Uh, all my sponsors are the, just the kind of people that you are. And so I'm really grateful to be able to 
have shared this time with you and shared you and your wisdom and your products with as many people as possible. So thank you so much for all your hard work and your commitment to living a better life for everybody. And I will say thank you to my sponsors for all your beautiful products and everything that we just heard Selena talk about is exactly the values that my sponsors have as well. And I don't offer you anything that I don't use in my own family and in my own life and have it tested thoroughly. And they too run a lot of tests to make sure that the pure purity and quality is there. And I've seen some of these long drawn out expensive tests that they do. So it's been a great visit together, Selena, and I'm excited that people will find the best salts in the world and spices and seasonings and the uh, salt water, sea water they can use for any number of different benefits. Find your books, find your information. And so lots of love to you. And thank you to all of you for joining us on Living 4D with Paul Check. I can't wait to share something exciting with you next week. See you then. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Selena DeLanga. You can find out more about Selena and Celtic Sea Salt at selenanaturally.com. Follow on Facebook and Instagram at Celtic Sea Salt. Selena is offering Paul's listeners 20% off their first order at selenanaturally.com using the promo code CHECK20 when you check out. You'll also receive a free copy of Selena's book, In Her Element. So visit selenanaturally.com and get 20% off your order using the promo code CHECK20. That's C-H-E-K, all uppercase, two zero. And you'll also get a complimentary book. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.